People without books, pens, and classrooms. Now that describes the pre colonial state of the nation now known as Nigeria. Formal education was one of the fallouts of the Lord Lugard led colonial administration with the Banj of Tafawa Balewa, Abafamiya Walowo, and Nnamdi Azikiwe to show for it. Nigeria's professor of political economy, Professor Patutomi, born in the pre-independence era, x-rays what education in the 1960s was like. Back in those days, uh, education was such worth, such value, that it was a joint project between the state, the uh, missionaries or PDAs, as they're called, private development agencies, which include communities um, and the private sector. He points out that education in the early post-independence era was nothing short of standard education as the nationalists endeavoured to invest in qualitative education, which brought about great impact on the nation. The Ashby Commission on Higher Education in Nigeria actually dared to suggest that in 1960-61, the quality of higher education in Nigeria was as good as the very best in the world. According to some academics, schools at that time were well-funded with the universities enjoying quality and basic infrastructure as students were motivated by the government to study. It was very competitive. And when you received the kind of quality of education through the public school system, you could, you know, hold your own anywhere. Um, and so competitively, a Nigerian um, graduates at different levels of education uh, were beating their peers in, uh, say, the Commonwealth uh, co competition, academic competitions or scholarships. Few universities, such as the University of Ibadan, established in 1948, the University of Nigeria, Nsuka, established in 1960, the Amadubelo University, Zaria, set up in 1962, the Abafamiya Wolowo University, Ileife, established in 1962, and the University of Lagos, set up in 1962, were all established in the earliest post-colonial era. With the rise in a number of academic institutions, both in the primary, secondary and universities, experts say that one constant challenge that the educational system seemed to have suffered over the years is the decline in qualitative education in the country. Now, what has happened is that from 1960 till date, we have refused to evolve with the changing times. Um, Nigeria has refused to make adjustments either in uh, a concept of what a curriculum means or the design of how learning takes place. People just start school without knowing the reason, you understand? And nobody at any point deems it fit to actually explain to them, this is why you're going to school, you understand? Helping the child also to like be himself. Sometimes you see children resenting learning. If we invest much more in our public school system and make our public schools much better, much more attractive, we will not have the proliferation we have today of uh, private universities and private secondary schools. Um, so, you know, but many of these private schools, they are actually the only hope for many families for a decent education for their children. Each year, Nigeria witnesses an increase in the number of Nigerian students traveling abroad to study in 2018 alone, at least a total of 332,727 students left the shores of the country to acquire foreign education, a phenomenon which some experts have constantly condemned as detrimental to the GDP of the nation. Um, so we've not really valued our own education. So what happens is we reward more times people who go out and come back. And so most people are looking at that model that it seems like that's what works. 
Um, it's all about uh, people finding out that um, if I go school abroad, I seem to have some form of respect. As the mouth of giant of Africa celebrates 60 years of independence as a nation, there is a call for all hands to be on deck to grow the educational sector if it must change its narrative as the poverty capital of the world. Mary Chinda reporting for Plus TV Africa. Interesting report there by Miri Chinda. I totally enjoyed it. Welcome back. Uh, and of course, uh, the conversation continues on Nigeria's Independence Day. Uh, now from uh, health, we move into education and we're joined by, of course, uh, two personalities who would be uh, sharing their views on some of the conversations that we're bringing up. We'd like to say uh, welcome to uh, Jimmy Ishafiade, uh, development expert. Thank you so much for joining us, sir. Good evening. Nice to be here. Thank you for joining us. And uh, virtually, we're also joined by Deton Ogo. Uh, thank you also as an education consultant. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. All right, I think we'll just start uh, uh, from that report we saw moments ago. Um, Pat um, Tommy, who is known in this country, talked about this nostalgia of uh, the education that was enjoyed in the past. We also know that um, most of the people from the past are still the ones in leadership. Yeah. What is stopping that transition, the quality of education that they had, and the quality of education that's been provided for the team in masses. Yes, indeed. Uh, so, first of all, let's get it right. Education is something that Nigerians have done well. So, I, I mean, I, I watched your, 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 your intro to, to, to this interview, and um, the point must be made that when it comes to education, we've actually done some things right. Part of Tommy was just making the point. 1960, we were very good. Um, 60s, uh, early 60s into 70s, we were actually able to train a workforce that could take over from the British, uh, institute a very good civil service system, and actually manage the oil boom. We actually did that. And um, going into the 70s and 80s, we actually had one Nobel laureate, yes. Um, if you go to many places the world over, you find Nigerians in very good... Um, 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 positions of knowledge delivery and all that and all that. So it's not been um, an entirely negative story when we're discussing um, education in Nigeria. It's just that, and this is what uh, the point I always make, Nigerians have broken barriers in education. But Nigeria as a corporate entity has not done very well. Why is that happening? And I think, uh, was it Obi Ezekwe Sili, who was yes. just making the point here? Um, we are failed because of universal basic education. We've not done right, that right. We've not uh, put the money where the mouth is, as it were. We've not, um, and, uh, so, so, why is it, so why are we failing in universal basic education? That's the question we should be asking. Um, I, I would like to interject and say, um, are you talking from a general perspective? Because we do hear first that we're the poverty capital, yeah. and we know that poverty and education, they don't have a relationship, so yeah. to speak. If you don't have education, poverty will continue. So exactly. if we are the poverty capital, yeah. we have children, millions, yeah. out of school, mm. not having access to education. Yeah. What strides really? I mean, I'm not trying to be pessimistic, but what are these positives in the mm. education sector that is not reflecting to the, um, in, the, in the general life of okay. the people? So we have to look at the picture in terms of domains of impact and socio-economic groupings. There is a professional class in Nigerian cities, Lagos, Abuja, Port Harcourt, maybe some cities in southwest Nigeria who actually switched on in terms of education. They know what they want for their children. They manage the education of their children properly because they themselves were well educated. Yes. Uh, they themselves had aspirations and they still have aspirations. I know friends of mine who are actually taking higher degrees in the 50s and 60s. So, so that socioeconomic group the urban middle class, the professional class, they are doing everything right in education. Look, go to Canada today. So you had uh, an interview uh, with some doctors. Uh? Yeah, Dr. Ogali. Yeah. One of them is in Canada. Ask him how many Nigerians are in Canada. Absolutely. Doing well, breaking barriers. Yes. The US, Asia, 
most, cities, most uh, countries in Europe. So that socioeconomic group has gotten it right in terms of education. Unfortunately, we've, we've, um, we've underemphasized universal basic education. Why is that? Because I think there's something about us, I think there's something about our social conditioning that has no, well, we, well maybe our urban culture does not uh, engender social conscience. And we, can, we, 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 we like to take care of ourselves. We like to take care of, uh, we like to be within a social group, take care of ourselves, feel comfortable within that social group. And we forget that there is that other <laughs> unempowered social grouping that needs all the help we can. What's, what's the problem with uh, UBE? So I've looked at the problem and what I'm seeing is that the local government system has not been allowed to function. Yes. That's, and that's the basic failing that we have with universal basic education. And universal basic education is impacting the lower income class, the rural poor, the urban poor. All right, uh, Molda, I'm gonna bring in um, uh, Ditto. Uh, she is um, education, an education consultant. Um, I, I want you to quickly share your thoughts on um, the decline in the quality of uh, public um, or government schools, as they are popularly called, um, across the country. Um, not very many parents today will, you know, boldly send their kids to any of those, you know, government schools. So what do you think um, maybe happened um, over time? And, you know, how do you think, you know, we might be able to fix that and, and bring um, more of those schools back to life and, um, you know, revive them? Thank you so very much for um, this opportunity. I honestly, um, when we discuss education, I'm very careful that we don't reduce it to just the schooling, um, uh, you know, the, comp the schooling component or the infrastructural component. To educate a child in this modern world, you know, it takes a lot of actors. It starts from the home front. And I like that we had, you know, uh, started from the issue around uh, poverty or the investment in our human capital um, at the level of health, at the level of education, as a nation state. So in, in, in discussing, um, you know, the role of education in unleashing um, human potential in Nigeria, you know, 60 years on, it's important for us to not reduce it just to infrastructure. So the public education system in Nigeria is obviously broken for issues around transparency, issues around accountability, issues around being a rent-seeking state. So all of those issues, you know, uh, uh, make us arrive at an outcome that is not serving the majority of the Nigerian populace. And those are the things that we should then also start questioning. I like that Mr. Yusafi actually, do, you know, talked about the premiums, where, where the premiums on education are placed. Uh, so there, there are regional issues around even the utility of education, the relevance of ed education, the interest in education. So once we discuss all of these things and dimension the issues, definitely demand is not much in supply. I work on the recruitment side of things, and there's a broken system that we must start, you know, uh, critiquing at different, you know, uh, factor points and resolving as we want to go into, you know, forward thinking and a forward move in a progressive state. Is there certain things that you, you know, would, you know, suggest that we must um, immediately um, invest in? I'm going to go back to Mr. Shafia uh, in a bit. Okay. Um, but, but uh, Dito, I want you to quickly speak on this before we go back. Is there, are there certain things yes. that you feel we must immediately start to invest in? Um, if you go to everywhere around, you know, Nigeria, yeah. there is 11-year-olds that are in mechanic workshops. There is nine-year-olds that are learning how to, you know, fix slippers. They don't go to yeah. school. Drive through the streets of Lagos. You would see mm -hmm. the age of the people who are cleaning your windshield so you can give them 50 naira. It's a pathetic yeah. situation. Is there mm -hmm. things that you feel we must do, aside school feeding programs and the likes, mm -hmm. to drag, drag yeah. these people back to, to school? I think that, you know, when there's a problem, it's very good for us to start at root causes. Mm -hmm. And over the years, I would find, I'm doing a bit of research in the space at the tertiary education, at a, a university at this time. I would largely say that we really need to start critiquing even our philosophy of education. And mm -hmm. let me 
give a practical example I gave during the pro program uh, earlier today. We discuss the German system a lot. We always refer to the German system. And if we go back to the why, why is it that, you know, what the German system has simply done is embrace the philosophy of education that is centered around even the way we humans are wired. Every human is endowed. Every human is, has their capabilities. What a system should do largely is to start thinking about you know, what quality means, not you know, beyond qualifications, a process where human, the, the spiritual, their cultural, the, you know, their values, the, who they are as human beings, their social skills are placed within a system where it can grow. You know, what we've managed to do over time, and I, and I think that um, our last speaker alluded to that, is post-colonial education was really to just send people into the, into the public sector. We need to also start connecting the dots for the contemporary Nigerian um, uh, reality, given the fact that 60% of our youth are you know, in that demographic, we have more young people in this environment than their older people. How are we, have we placed a premium on educating these people in a way that is relevant and contextual to where the Nigerian state itself is trying to get to? So when we discuss Singapore, we discuss Malaysia, it is largely driven by the DNA of who are we, what's our identity as a nation, and how are we channeling our human capital in that direction? So it's more a capabilities approach. If it's that you know, the, 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 I, I would say that it's a misuse of human potential for us to have a young person fixing, um, you know, the examples you said earlier on. If that cannot be the best use of human potential, yeah. what our All system right. needs to do is structure in a way that people are able to derive economic value uh, for themselves, for, for economics. I mean, I would ask right now, in modern day Nigeria now, what is, the re what is the utility or relevance of an education that you go to spend years on, the, the state spends years on, and you can't even feed yourself afterwards? You're not right. even able um, to support let, your family. Because, of course, also, you know, other macroeconomic contentions around job creation, we really must begin with the end in mind. When you educate a child, and, and, and I would say that it's not for the lack of us not having policies. It's been around the issues of, you know, uh, uh, coordination. It's been around the issues of stakeholder engagement, public, you know, uh, private. Right now, I think that we really just need to really critique the inconsistencies or the contradictions in how the education system you know wants to reach the heights of excellence as a state you're, 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 you're actually you're actually capital. making we some really uh, i'm sorry how to interrupt you what, what you're saying potential? those are the questions that we should be asking from this point on uh, i mean you're making so many exciting points for me because education is something that i am passionate about as well that is my background and something you said about um the philosophy of education. I'll, I'll, I'll take it to you, sir. Yeah. The philosophy of education. Mm. She has highlighted a couple of areas yeah. that we need to begin to look at. Yeah. For you, yeah. where can we start? Because yeah. the rot is everywhere. Primary, secondary, yeah. tertiary. Yeah. Uh, where can we start? So let's start from looking not too deep within our culture. And I'm going to use an example. So the Igbo tribe, Southeast tribe. Yes. So this guy's line business without going to school. Yes. And they get best, better at it, and they beat the old world at it. System. So that's apprenticeship, right? Yeah, okay, so how can we borrow elements from that and put it into the more formalized um, systems of delivering curri curri curriculum or whatever? Curricula or whatever? Um, how can we um, make education more exciting? How can we make it more practical? How can we derive... Um, more immediate benefits from it instead of the keep no, somebody no. in for 10 years and it's completely useless to society while well, he's learning. So these are the things that we should be, and is it this government that will do it or is it this set of leaders? Maybe not, but it's something we should start looking at. Why not them? I mean, the, the time to start is now. The, the reason we are having this conversation is yeah. because we're 60 years old, okay. yet we still have so many things troubling us. We don't even seem to have... I know you started by saying there's a lot of uh, positives in yeah. the education sector, but yeah. a lot of persons will say there's even more rot that yeah. we had in the past. Yeah. So we, I mean, these are the set of leaders we have. We chose yeah, them. Yeah. So they have to do the work, don't you think? Yeah, so we, we, so we have to inc improve uh, and increase advocacy for some of the things that we um, want from leadership. 
Um, we need to be able to talk to our legislators in a more you know, robust way and give them practical ideas, which is something I like about your station, by the way. So you're all about practical solutions and so on and so forth. So the Igbo apprentice, Igbo apprentice system mm -hmm. yeah. is a good model to use in delivering skills and competencies to Nigerian youths. We should start doing something about that. How about also digitalizing uh, the delivery of content? Why can't every school in Nigeria have a digital resource room? Two million naira per classroom, nothing more than that. And you can deliver science education, business education, entrepreneurship um, skills, electronics, um, plumbing, carpentry, easily. Maybe um, a, a technician, a technical teacher comes once a week to also add to that. And you build up this German type kind of um, um, education that we are all uh, saying we want, we want. All right, um, Deto, I think I would uh, go back to you. One of the things that you also spoke about, and I think it's one of the most exciting things that has been mentioned in the, in the conversation, is uh, the philosophy of Nigerian education. Yeah. Um, um, you know, we, we seem to have a system where everyone is forced to go through a system um, and expected, or is expected to be educated at the end. But, you know, there's a lot of graduates today who, you know, still, you know, we, we can't um, be very, very proud of. So, Deto, I, I, I would like to, you know, come back to you. Um, with uh, talking about one of the picture that you painted about getting out of school and still not being able to fend for yourself. Um, yeah. Will it be a waste of time to be investing more in education without putting equal investment into all the sectors that make it, you know, make a person useful after being educated? Mm. I would say that um, in, in Nigeria largely, okay, and I'll give a very practical example. Over the last couple of weeks, I've been interviewing decision makers when it comes to recruitment of the average Nigerian youth. And it was quite depressing to observe that at the end of the day, what the certificate, the current modern day certificate in Nigeria is used for, it's not when it, you know when you think about recruitment practices and you know some of these these are best some of the best in you know the kind of firms that our young people aspire and want to go into. The tool that is usually used to make those selection processes, we need to be sure that it is is in sync with whatever it is that's been invested down the university line, the supply you know even from the crash. What I have found over time is that, and I've I've been a recruiter, I've done mass recruitment. Um, is that we need to find out why right now, right now in reality, it's just usually used as, you know, let me take, you know, a CV or a credential. It's just baseline. You know, the promise of education itself, um, you know, should go beyond a credential. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. Have I lost you? No, 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 you, you, we still have okay. you. If you can wrap up maybe in, in 40 seconds so we can bring... Okay, um, so just to answer the question around... Um, we really need to ensure that supply meets demand and that the dots are being connected. What are the 21st century skills that we're empowering our young people with? And I will advise a young person who is at home caught in all of the, you know, uh, the, the, the challenges in the ecosystem. Look for your colleagues that are other parts of the world. The, the, the digitalization has liberalized education. Make sure that you're building your capacity because there's free content online. You have no excuse. It is your human potential. You must hone it, develop it, and ensure that you're not caught in the distortions within the education system where you find yourself. All right, there's an intriguing aspect that um, the well, I actually had this conversation with a couple of persons a few days ago, and mm. we, we talked about the fact that when there was a government, it was government primary responsibility to yeah. provide education, there seemed yeah. to be an edge. Now we have a proliferation mm. of private schools, yeah. and then we have the uh, public schools being relegated to the background. Yeah. Is it that it is the, the, the emergence of private schools that is affecting uh, the quality of education? Or is, is, is there a point we need to get to to strike a balance between the number of private schools we have and the public schools that we have? Thank you very much. So there is a, a thing they call accreditation. So government um, should, and I think they are, um, 
encouraging private investment in education. Um, it's just to make the, um, the ecosystem more eclectic. So we should have everything. We should have public schools. We should have private schools. We should have cheap private schools, expensive private schools, um, technical colleges. I'm going to, I, I hope we have time to, to, to actually we still have a few minutes. Deep, take a deep dive into dive. So there should be an eclectic mix of options for parents and young individuals who want to train themselves and get skills. But government should not step back from its role as a regulator. Well, why, why, yeah. that's, that's, that's the yeah. point that we actually yeah. had a fight on. Yeah. Why would, when they can afford yeah. to send their children to all the options yeah. that you've mentioned, yeah. why would they invest yeah. in enhancing private schools? Some of them even have, I mean, own their own private yeah, schools. Yeah, so yeah. Why would they invest in the public school for the poor man to come and outshine them? <laughs> okay, so government, <laughs> government as an entity has it as a, it's something that they must do. It's a Thank you very much. It's a responsibility for them to develop the educational sector. Individuals in government would have their own personal agenda. It is so want to make money. Make yeah, it's individual, yeah, of course. So it's back to the advocacy thing again that we said. So we Nigerians should be able to demand minimum rights. So we we're talking about um, constitutional, you know, restructuring. Why don't we blaze, base everything on individuals? We are Nigerians, we deserve something. Leave tribe out of it, leave ethnic nationality out of it. You are an individual in Nigeria, you own a green passport, you deserve a few things. And you should fight for those things. So it's, it's um, so yeah, you, the, the point you are making is quite uh, valid that um, individuals in government uh, don't have an incentive to develop public schools and um, government uh, institutions because they want everybody to take their kids to. <laughs> Although those, those uh, like again, it's, it's back to those domains and, um, and um, socioeconomic groupings again. Not everybody can afford the private schools. Yes. So there will still be the 80% of Nigerians who will send their kids to the unity schools, and I think it still goes back to yeah. what you both um, um, uh, seem to yeah. uh, align with, yeah. the philosophy of education. Yeah. And to evolve that, we need to have um, a system that has checks and balances, processes, yeah. and all of that. Don't you think so, uh, Dr. Uh, I, I definitely think so, that we need to connect those dots. Uh, mm. As a matter of urgency, we need to connect. And I would say, you know, um, uh, vocational education, we need to pay more attention to unleashing hands, unleashing minds. We shouldn't focus only on uh, university education. We have the massive population. We should put our young people to work, um, you know, having standards, measurements in place uh, to ensure that people get accredited early on and they're able to, you know, feed themselves, make a livelihood, be productive um, as, a, as, an, as, as a vision of the system and a promise of the system to them. Okay, you want to uh, oh, yeah, in? so I want to make this business proposition to Nigerian billionaires, right? So Yes, please. You want to make money in Nigeria. Nigerians like educating their children. Young Nigerians want to acquire skills. Mechatronics, um, electronics, yes. um, robotics, AI. They, th those are technological skills. There are also technical skills that are in demand now. Plumbing, carpentry, air conditioning mm. and ref. Why don't you divert that money you want to use to set up another American university uh, and put it into vocational tertiary education? Yes. Yeah. First of all, you'll be training people out in quite, quite, uh, maybe two, three years. And those people will, will earn money and um, also tell their friends to also come. And come. Learn. So there's a lot of benefits for, 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 private money to go into this area. And it's something that we should start looking at. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a surprise to me that we have this massive skills gap within the economy, and there's nobody just... We, we, taking, we have construction jobs, and we, we have construction people from jobs. China we to have come welding and jobs. jobs for us. Yeah, yes, look at right. railways. Yes. So railways is another big area that we are going to need skills. And it's going to, it's going to be in demand in the hundreds of thousands. Nobody's looking at that. 
Oh, well, um, I think the Nigerian businessman wants to get profit uh, out into. I mean, they yeah. have, there's a lot of money to be made in education. Yeah. Yeah. There is a lot of yeah. money there. It's not, yeah. it's not maybe well. Great thing that you've put it out there, yeah. you know. So yeah. um, I'm, hope, I'm hoping that it gets out there. Yeah. Um, Dito, I, I want you to quickly speak also on the um, influx of um, information technology. Um, where mm -hmm. that age where you have no excuse to not be educated as it as it stands mm -hmm. um, do you yeah. think that you know we can take advantage of, of that um, and get people yeah. to be educated um, somehow some way um, regardless of you know having a certificate oh I, I think I think that's the premise of the fourth industrial revolution um, and really we, we really have to you, you know I think sometimes what we what is never really for grounded for us in Nigeria is that we really sometimes don't see the numbers or we're, we're not, we, 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 the, the, or the numbers are under the radar. Hmm. So if we understand that there were 200 million of us, only 52 million of us, she's, you know, only 52 million of us are at work, th those are the kind of questions. How do we use technology? How do we use, how do we ensure that, you know, um, our crediting systems are not hindering and keeping people back. So rather than a six, I mean, if you look at the example in Google, Google has made a decision that the things that you can come and do within their system after, you know, six months of learning. But the premise of that kind of decision is because the secondary school, the exit point for a young person at secondary school, that person already has a basket of skills. Their skill stock is strong enough to thrive in the American economy, even if they exit. So I think there are also issues around perception, the issues around, you know, if my son is not a doctor, if he's a plumber, we need to start breaking those perceptions down. What we need are more of our people at work. What we need is a robust school to work, workforce development system that goes beyond giving people just two pieces of certificate and leaving them to roam in the labor market in Nigeria. We must hone human capital like any other capital that this country has been blessed with. And it starts by beginning with that end in mind. How many numbers, and if you look at countries like India, they have a strong, and it, was, it took a decision, it took a strong policy decision and said our export will be our people, will be the skill set of our people. And we need to start thinking about that at different tiers, you know, so university education, tertiary education, and if you notice, um, even Mrs. Dr. Kwesele spoke about it, and the wonderful reform work she did at, the, at that time, vocational institutions, career centers, just unleash, 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 unleash the potential of people wherever they are within their own communities. Our country will be better for it. Little Ogwa, uh, Ogwa, I beg your pardon, an education consultant. <laughs> Thank you so much for speaking with us. It's been really, really interesting. Really, I must say that too. Thank you. <laughs> and, um, Thank you for so, having me. I'm really grateful. Thank always. you. Mr. Jimmy Shafiade, uh, thank you also for thank joining you us. Really so thank you for the work that you do as well. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you for the much. brilliant idea you also got to share on our platform. Yeah. Thank you. Hello. Hope you enjoyed the news. Please do subscribe to our YouTube channel and don't forget to hit the notification button so you get notified about fresh news updates.